Good morning, everybody. Uh, I am here at Powell Elementary School and just had a chance to see some of the outstanding students here. Uh, and I, I thought it was an appropriate setting for me to say a few words about the budget that I sent to Congress this morning. Uh, because obviously the budget is not just about numbers, it's about our values. Uh, and it's about our future. And how well we are laying the groundwork for uh, those young children that I was with just a few moments ago uh, to be able to succeed uh, here in America. Uh, these kids may not be the most excited people in town on budget day, uh, but uh, my budget is designed uh, with their generation and future generations in mind. Now, in my State of the Union address, I laid out an agenda to restore opportunity f for all people, uh, to uphold the principle that uh, no matter who you are, no matter where you started, you can make it if you try here in America. Uh, this opportunity agenda is built on four parts. More good jobs at good wages, making sure that we're training workers with the skills they need to get those good jobs, uh, guaranteeing every child access to a world-class education, and making sure that uh, our economy is one in which uh, hard work is rewarded. The budget I sent Congress this morning lays out how we'll implement this agenda in a balanced and responsible way. It's a roadmap for creating jobs with good wages and expanding opportunity for all Americans. Uh, and at a time when our deficit's been cut in half, uh, it allows us to meet our obligations to future generations without leaving them a mountain of debt. Uh, this budget adheres to the spending levels that both parties in both houses of Congress already agreed to. But it also builds on that progress with what we're calling an Opportunity Growth and Security Initiative that invests in our economic priorities in a smart way that is fully paid for by making smart spending cuts and closing tax loopholes that right now only benefit the well-off and the well-connected. I'll give you an example. Uh, right now our tax system provides benefits to wealthy individuals who save, even after they've amassed multi-million dollar retirement accounts. By closing that loophole, we can help create jobs and grow the economy and expand opportunity without uh, adding a dime to the deficit. We know that the country that wins the race for new technologies will win the race for new jobs. So this budget creates 45 high-tech manufacturing hubs where businesses and universities will partner to turn groundbreaking research into new industries and new jobs made in America. We know, and this is part of the reason why we're here today, that education has to start at the earliest possible ages. So this budget expands access to the kind of high quality preschool uh, and other learning programs to give all of our children the same kinds of opportunities that those wonderful children that we just saw uh, are getting uh, right here at Powell. We know that while not all of today's good jobs are gonna require a four uh, year college degree, more and more of them are gonna require some form of higher education or specialized training. So. This budget expands apprenticeships to connect more ready-to-work Americans with ready-to-be-filled jobs. And we know that future generations will continue to deal with the effects of a warming planet. So this budget proposes a smarter way to address the costs of wildfires. And it includes over $1 billion in new funding for new technologies to help communities prepare for a changing climate today and set up incentives to build smarter and more resilient infrastructure. We also know that the most effective and historically bipartisan ways to reduce poverty and help hardworking families pull themselves up is the Earned Income Tax Credit. Uh, right now, it helps about half of all parents in America at some point in their lives. This budget gives millions more workers the opportunity to take advantage of the tax credit. And it pays, uh, it pays for it by closing loopholes like the ones that let wealthy individuals classify themselves as a small business to avoid paying their fair share of taxes. Uh, this budget will also continue to put our fiscal house in order uh, over the long term, not by putting the burden on folks who can least afford it, but by reforming our tax code and our immigration system and building on the progress that we've made to reduce health care costs under the Affordable Care Act. And it puts our debt on a downward path uh, as a share of our total economy, which independent experts have set as a critical target for fiscal responsibility. As I said at the outset, uh, our budget is about choices. Uh, it's about our values. 
As a country, we've got to make a decision if we're going to protect tax breaks for the wealthiest Americans or if we're going to make smart investments necessary to create jobs and grow our economy and expand opportunity for every American. At a time when our deficits are falling at the fastest rate in 60 years, we've got to decide if we're going to keep squeezing the middle class or if we're going to continue to reduce the deficits responsibly while taking steps to grow and strengthen the middle class. Uh, the American people have made clear time and again uh, which approach they prefer. That's the approach that my budget offers. That's why I'm going to fight for it uh, this year and in the years to come uh, as President. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, Mr. Yeah, Mike. Do you have any uh, response to President Putin's uh, press conference this morning? Is Chancellor Merkel right that he's lost touch with reality? And have you spoken with him again personally? Uh, I haven't spoken to him since I spoke to him this past weekend. Uh, but obviously, uh, me and my national security team have been watching uh, events unfolding in Ukraine very closely. I, I met with them again today. Uh, as many of you know, John Kerry is in Kiev as we speak. Uh, at my direction. Uh, he's expressing our full support for the Ukrainian people. Over the past several weeks, we've are, been working uh, with our partners and with the IMF uh, to build international support for uh, a package that helps to stabilize Ukraine's economy. Uh, and today, we announced a significant package of our own to support uh, the Ukraine's economy uh, and also to provide them with the technical assistance that they need. So it includes a, uh, a planned loan guarantee package of uh, $1 billion. Uh, it, it provides immediate technical expertise to uh, Ukraine to repair its economy. And importantly, uh, it provides for assistance to help Ukraine plan for elections that are going to be coming up very soon. Uh, you know, as I said yesterday, it is important that Congress stand with us. Uh, I don't doubt the bipartisan concern that's been expressed about the situation in the Ukraine. There is something immediately Congress can do uh, to help us, and that is to help finance uh, the economic package that can stabilize the economy in Ukraine, uh, help to make sure that uh, fair and free elections take place very soon, uh, and as a consequence, uh, helps to de-escalate the crisis. Uh, in the meantime, we're consulting with uh, our international allies across the board. Uh, together, the international community uh, has condemned uh, Russia's violation of the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine. Uh, we've condemned their intervention in Crimea, uh, and we are calling for a de-escalation of the situation and international monitors that can go into the country right away. Uh, and above all, we believe that the Ukrainian people should be able to decide their own future, uh, which is why the world should be focused on helping them stabilize the situation economically and move towards the fair and free elections that uh, are currently scheduled to take place in May. Um, there have been some reports that uh, President Putin is uh, pausing for a moment and reflecting on what's happened. Uh, I think that we've all seen that uh, from the perspective of the European Union, the United States, uh, allies like Canada and Japan, uh, and uh, allies and friends and partners around the world, uh, there is a strong belief that Russia's action is violating international law. Uh, I know uh, President Putin seems to uh, have a, a different set of lawyers uh, making a different set of interpretations, but uh, I, I don't think that's fooling anybody. I think everybody recognizes that uh, although Russia has uh, legitimate interests uh, in what happens in a neighboring state, that does not give it the right uh, to use force uh, as a means of exerting influence inside of that state. Uh, we have said that if, in fact, there is any evidence out there that uh, Russian speakers or Russian natives or, or uh, Russian nationals are in any way being threatened, uh, there are ways of dealing with that through international mechanisms. Uh, and we're prepared to make sure that the rights of all Ukrainians are upheld. And, in fact, in conversations that we've had with the government, uh, in Kiev, they have been uh, more than willing to work with the international community and with Russia uh, to provide such assurances. Uh, so uh, the fact that we are still seeing soldiers out of their barracks uh, in Crimea uh, is an indication uh, to which uh, what's happening there is not based on actual concern for uh, Russian nationals or 
uh, Russian speakers inside of Ukraine, but is based on uh, Russia seeking uh, through force uh, to exert influence on uh, a neighboring country. Uh, that is not how international law is supposed to operate. Um, I, I, I would also note just, uh, you know, the way that uh, some of this has been reported, uh, that uh, the suggestion somehow that um, uh, the Russian actions uh, have been uh, clever strategically. Uh, I actually think that this has not been a sign of, of strength, but uh, rather uh, is a reflection that uh, countries near Russia uh, have deep concerns and suspicions about this kind of meddling, and if anything, it will push uh, many countries further away uh, from Russia. Uh, there is the ability for Ukraine to be a friend of the West's and uh, a friend of Russia's, as long as none of us are in uh, inside of Ukraine trying to meddle uh, and intervene, certainly not militarily, uh, with decisions that properly belong to the Ukrainian people. And that's the principle that um, uh, John Kerry is going to be uh, speaking to uh, during his visit. Uh, I'll be making additional calls today to some of our key uh, foreign partners, uh, and I suspect I'll be doing that all week and in through the weekend. Uh, but as I indicated yesterday, um, you yeah, know, the course of history is for people to want to be free to make their own decisions about their own futures. And the international community, uh, I think, is unified in believing that um, it is not uh, the role of uh, an outside force uh, where there's been no evidence of uh, serious violence, uh, where there's been no rationale under international law uh, to intervene in people trying to determine their own destiny. Uh, so we stand on uh, the side of history that uh, I think more and more people around the world deeply believe in, uh, the principle that uh, a sovereign people, an independent people, are able to make their own decisions about their own lives. Um, and you know, Mr. Putin can uh, throw a lot of words out there, but the facts on the ground indicate that right now he's not abiding by, uh, by that principle. Uh, there is still the opportunity for Russia to do so, uh, working with the international community to help stabilize the situation. And we've sent a clear message that uh, we are prepared to work with anybody if their genuine interest is making sure that uh, Ukraine um, is able to govern itself. Uh, and as I indicated before, and something that I think has not been emphasized enough, they are currently scheduled to have elections in May. And everybody in the international community should be invested in making sure that the economic uh, deterioration that's happened in Ukraine stops, but also that these elections uh, proceed in a fair and free way in which all Ukrainians, including Russian speakers uh, inside of Ukraine, are able to express their choice of who should lead them. Uh, and if we have a strong, uh, robust, legitimate election, uh, then there shouldn't be any question uh, as to whether uh, the Ukrainian people are uh, govern themselves uh, without the kinds of outside interference that, that we see Russia exerting. All right? Thank you very much, everybody.